And we're looking at our class assignment in the book. And of course, if you're looking in the book, uh, here's where it is in the book, text A. But I've made a file for myself. I just copied this in. And so I have it over in a file that's got space in it so I can add to it. I think we got down to right here. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Uh, Chris, can you take it from yes. there down to the Asus, all the way down to there? To the end. Right there, where it's highlighted. Oh, uh, a tone? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yes, I can do that. Uh, Eron un lithos balin ep a tone. So I put that as uh, they took up, therefore, stones to cast uh, upon or at him. Okay. If you study about how they stone someone, they usually put them almost down in a hole, uh, like a ditch, and they'd throw the stones down at them. See? I didn't and know that. that they get the, uh, greater velocity on the throne, on the stones. Okay. But uh, we don't know for sure they did that with Steve. This is probably Stephen, I'm thinking. No, this is Jesus, isn't it? They, they were going to stone Jesus. All right. So they took up. What uh, tense is that? Oh, I didn't write it down. I'll need some help on that. Anybody else? James, what, what tense do you get on it? James, are you there? Yes, I am. Sorry, I had it on mute. Okay. Uh, Arist. <laughs> yeah, it is Arist. Third person plural, Arist. Okay. A viral. All right. What about Balain? What is that? That's an infinitive. Or is it Arist or is it present? I put present. Uh, I think it's Arist. Oh, is it? Okay. It's, it's Arist infinitive. All right. And we can go back and look, look at the difference. And they are kind of tricky. So let's take a quick look at the difference here. Uh, I think right here. No, I don't want that one. Information for students. I've been making some more paradigms, OK? But notice you got the ain ending and the ain ending. The oh. only difference is the diacritical markings. Okay. See, so see yeah. the iota has a diacritical marking. Yes. That'll sure fool you, and you can get caught up into it if you're not careful. So yeah. this has the okay. iota with the circumflex. Okay. And that is that is real tricky. Okay. <laughs> I'm curious if it's significant that it says stones instead of rocks in this place here. Does it basically mean rocks at this place? Well, a stone is uh, something that's been shaped. Mm -hmm. So these are probably kind of round type stones that make them easier to throw. All right. OK. Lithos is something shaped. Petros is not shaped necessarily. Just okay. irregular shapes. So could the uh, shape be a natural shape, like it was shaped by the water? Yes, or is water, water moving. I think probably during the flood, uh, okay. it was shaped that way. So it's not necessarily someone shaped it by hand or with tools. It could be that nature shaped it. But it, yeah, either way, it could be. Probably these were nature shaped, though. Okay. okay. Now, whenever the uh, they have found on battlefields, on Roman battlefields. The Roman soldiers used slingshots, and uh, so they had slingshots, and they would they would take their stones and try to make them as round as a like a ball as they could on their slingshots, so they'd go straight, and okay. they and they engraved the names of their general on their stones. They just carved them in, and oh, wow. and I'll sometimes put a message on them: take that or something like that, you know. <laughs> from general so and so, okay, <laughs> and they would. So they had some writing. Sometimes they'd actually write it on their stones. They'd have a bag of those stones. Those slingshot guys would, 
they'd work on them. They'd just smooth them and work them until they got them as round as they could, like a ball. So, but they found them on battlefields. Of course, once you know a stone's not going to break down very, very, very quickly. Okay. Any comments there? I do have a question. Yes. Uh, the infinitive there. When would you ever use a present infinitive when your main verb is an aorist? You could. Uh, the infinitive here uh, indicates what they're doing. Okay. And they're, it's more like a single act. They're going to they're going to accomplish this and be through with it. If it were present infinitive, they would be doing it over and over to him. But they intend to kill him, so they won't just they'll just do it one time. Okay. And so that that'd be the only difference in the infinitives. And you could have a present infinitive and a aorist verb, or present infinitive and present verb, or Aorist infinitive and aorist verb and aorist infinitive and present verb. Okay, it just depends on what kind of action you're trying to accomplish with your infinitive. Does that make sense? Yeah, I probably need to think through that a little bit more, but I see what you're saying. Yeah. If it was a, an aorist verb and an aorist infinitive, then what do you see as the meaning? Well, the verb is, and they took them up, took them up like a single act. They just picked up stones to get ready. And so they're, they're and they're just, it's just a summation of what they did. They may have put two or three stones, picked them up. They may have put, picked up four or five stones each and held four of them in the left hand and then was got ready to throw with their right hand or something like that. But it's an accomplished act. And so they got their stones ready and they're going to accomplish in one act. They're going to they're going to stone him. And that would take just a minute or two, a few minutes to be through with it. And uh, if if they were uh, going to stone him repeatedly, then they would have used uh, a present tense for bullying. And it would have been present instead of rarest. So it's the amount of amount of I'm I'm sorry. I thought you're done. No, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I was just. They're going to stone him continuously. Well, they they generally stoned till they thought the individual was dead. Yes, but anyhow, the the summation the heiress could be a, a an action going on for a, for years even, but it's viewed as a single act. Right. An accomplished act, something they've finished and accomplished, whereas uh, the and. It, Present tense would have been ongoing and keep doing it. Right. Okay. I'm I'm good. Thank you. All right. Okay. Can you take the rest of the verse for us here? Uh, if you would there. James. Yes, sir. Ye sooth the excel then. Ek tu yeru. Uh, and Jesus went out of the temple. Okay. Or went out from the temple. And so we have X is really what preposition? X, the. See, the X. copy gets changed to C, doesn't it? Because the ADA. Okay, so we have X, X. So that's pretty emphatic, isn't it? And this is from Erkomai. This is from Erkomai, a form of Erkomai. So he went out, out of the, of the temple, right? Now this right here, there's two words for temple, and they get in. We're not going to get into that, but there's two different words for temple. One of them is the uh, is the whole complex, and the other one is where the priest went. Of course, Jesus wasn't in where the priest went, but okay. uh -huh. because he was wrong tribe, it'd been sin for him to be in there. Okay, and he didn't sin. Okay, all right. So uh, so right here, that's that is. Uh, what what tense is that? See the theta. Yes, I do see the theta. That's uh, and there's an oh. augment. See the augment. See that. Okay. 
I was going to get guess perfect, but that's probably wrong. <laughs> it's asked. Third person singer asked. Yeah. Second asked is what it is. Okay. Doesn't have a segment to say. Second asked. Okay. So, and so it's a, it's a single act accomplished or just sum up right quick. And they sum it all up. He went out of the temple. Okay. Right. Does that make sense, everybody? Any questions? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get rid of this file. We're through with it. All right. Now, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to, we're going to do some wandering around a bit uh, in some files. So I'm going to go to page 193 on this file that I sent you. Greek grammar and uh, lexicon and grammar notes. And if you have your file, you can open it up there, but you, you can look at it right on the screen here. So what we have here is we're looking at the word may. Now, this is the one of the words for no or not, isn't it? All right now, what's the difference in ooh and may? Here's ooh, and up here's may. Here's may. All right, what is the difference? Who denies the fact? Yeah, who denies the fact and may is more subjunctive dealing with the will. Yes, that's that's it. But I want us to see a couple and that is correct. I want us to see a couple of other things about it that'll be real helpful in interpreting the Bible. I didn't want to get into uh, just start in on this next lesson tonight. So I, I thought I'd catch up on a lot of other stuff that we covered briefly and I want to cover it more thoroughly. So we want to look at May and how it's used and ooh. And this will be, I think, helpful in understanding the Bible and interpreting some passages. So let's look here on this page right down here. He said, who closes the door abruptly? May is a qualified negation. I call it the kind of an iffy not. Uh, and the general distinction is who is objective, dealing with only the facts, Deny the facts. That is not a, an apple. That's a, that's a pear. I say, well, that's a that's a peach. Uh, so we have here. While well, may is subjective, and so that's the word that would be used when you're commanding somebody. See, you're commanding them to change their will or their thought. Don't think such a thing. See, and that's that's what we would be in a commandment. Does that make sense? What we're saying? Okay. Uh, all right, now I want you to get one other thing in here, if you would. The, the negative, and that would be ooh or may, either one, depending on which, which one is going to be used. In general, the negative comes before the words that are negativized. That's Robertson, page 430, his big grammar. Summers, in his grammar, says in Greek, the negative particle, this is called a particle, a, figure, a, a part of speech called a particle, ooh and may are. Is usually placed immediately in front of the word it negates. Hence, its normal position is in front of the verb. So that's what we're going to expect it to be. And so it's not in front. It's not after what it negates. That's not normal. Okay. All right. Uh, another thing about O. It is common to say that O does not occur with the infinitive, not even in indirect assertion. So what's going to occur with the infinitive and when you negate it? Order tells us it's may. Say may predominates predominates with imperatives, infinitives, and participles. All right. Down here, Robertson and Davis. They, and so they say the negative for the infinitive is may, even an in indirect assertion. Sometimes who occurs, and I, I think I found it one or two times in the New Testament from all the authorities. And I'm not even sure I agree with them on those two passages, on those two verses that I've found them listening. But the negative for a single phrase are contracts, not negative or inf of infinitive. So who sometimes occurs, but it is the negative of a single phrase or con contrast. So it's not negating the infinitive per se, but the whole phrase. Does that make, see the difference? So when the infinitive is negated, it's it's may. Right. And there's and I've looked gone through all these books and I found 
they they claim there are one or two verses, but they're really negating the whole phrase, not the actual infinitive. All right now, here's something I want you to see. This is kind of important, and of course, two things you want to get: the negative almost always goes right before, immediately before the word it negates, and o negates a finite verb. All right, may will in and negate your infinitives and participles, and it will be a subjunctive mood and commandments. Okay, it can negate them as well in the indicative mood. All right. Now, here's an interesting thing here. Uh, we just went through this, I believe. Yeah. In sentences that are interrogative. Now, what's interrogative? Uh, what? Question. A question. All right, so if we're asking a question, the general distinction between who and may is who is objective, or the unknown facts may is subjective. With the well and thought in the New Testament, who is almost uh, entirely confined to the indicative may monopolize the other moods. All right, now, here, who emphasizes a definite emphatic negation, may is indefinite, see, it's doubtful negation. When I command you not to do something, I don't know whether you will or not. I don't know whether you'll obey it. See, that's why with the commandment, it's pretty, uh, it's, you, you're not certain about what's going to happen there. All right. Now, if a negation is to be asserted unequivocally, who is always used? If hypothetically, may is invariably used. So if it's hypothetical, you use may. All right. Uh, it's kind of important to kind of keep that in mind that we can get into some. Uh, A.T. Robertson illustrates it here. And I'll highlight it. I like his illustration. Dr. A.T. Robertson has a happy way of illustrating to his students the difference between the meaning between these negatives by picturing a graphically a young man proposing to his lady friend. If she answers may, it may mean only mean that she wants to be coaxed a little longer or that she is still in a state of uncertainty. But if she responds, oh, he might as well get his hat and, and leave at once. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty plain, isn't it? <laughs> kind of illustrates it pretty well, I think. All right, now here's, here's what we run into. Uh, this will work with may and o with the words o days. That's not one or may days, not one. All right. Or o kete or o day or o may. And make it a other forms of it, and when it's compounded, the, these these rules still work with it. Okay, All right. Now here is what I want us to really see. What happens when we ask a question? Now, if in English, if I ask a question, I could say, "He's not. He's not." Uh, I'll say to some woman that I've just met. That man's not your husband, is he? What am I asking her? I'm asking uh, her to tell me whether he's her, her husband or not, see? So, or I could say, that child over there, that's, it, that's not your child, is it? So we can say it, we can say it two different ways. The first way, I think he might be, and kind of iffy, I'm not sure. And the second one, I'm saying, that's not your child, is it? So I'm assuming it's not. But the Greek way here is, if you ask a question and use may, it implies you expect a no answer. That's not your child, is it? See, if you use ooh, now this is Dan and Maddie. Here is uh, Porter. All right. Question expecting a negative answer normally is negated by may. In questions that are asked affirmatively, now here, right here, uh, or negatively, O is used with the indicative to, and in, imply an affirmative answer is expected. <coughs> and may is imply a negative answer is expected. So if may is used in a question, what answer do they expect? Help me out. Negative sometimes, answer. Negative answer. Not, say. May is sometimes used with the right one. A negative answer is expected. Now, 
I'm going to go over to a passage in the New Testament. I want you to see it. So we're going to come over here to our passage. Right here is 1 Corinthians 12, 29 and 30. Let's look at it in the American Standard, then we'll go to the Greek text. Are all apostles. If you have, I think, now the New American Standard has, it's one of these modern translations that they keep changing it, modifying it a bit from time to time. And uh, what they do is, uh, when they started out, I think they were real good. Then they then they got kind of sloppy, and then they went back to what they had originally. Okay, so if you got the early edition or the latest edition, it'll it'll be right on this passage. And I don't know what you have. I have a, I have a three different issues of it. And uh, it reads two different ways, depending on which, which uh, edition you have of it. Are all apostles? I think one version of it reads, are all are not apostles, are they? See? And uh, there's another translation or two that reads that way. And let's see if the Greek actually backs that up. The, is everybody an apostle in the first century? Yes or no? Tell me. Well, we, answer, we know the answer to that is no, don't we? Was everybody in the first century a prophet? Well, we know that's that's answer no, see? Now, but we get into our all teachers, and here's a problem in the church. I've heard this all my life. Everybody should be a teacher. Well, I don't think so. I'll, I'll give you my, my thinking on this in just a moment. But let's see what the Greek actually says here in this verse, verse 29. Go over here to the New Testament Greek. This is... Uh, all right, and I don't think there's any textual variants that change this anyhow in the end of the manuscripts anyhow. May pontes is all apostoloi apostles, question mark, or all apostles. And with may, what answer do they expect? Help me out. No. They expect no. May is used with the negative answers expected, see? Right. Here's Porter. Okay. So what the New American Standard then, what it does for us, uh, it actually translates it that way. All or not, at least if you, if you have the latest edition and the very earliest edition uh, of it, all or not apostles, are they? Okay. And there's two or three other translations that translate it that way also. And any questions? So we know there was only a few apostles anyhow, it was only 14. So we know the answer to that one is no, just from text of the Bible. May pontes prophetai. May pontes prophet, prophetai. All are not apostles, are they? See? So all are not apostles, all are not prophets, are they? Same, same structure. So everybody in the first century wasn't apostles. Everybody in the first century wasn't a, a prophet. May, Pontes didascaloi, that's teachers. All are not teachers, are they? And if they all weren't teachers in the first century, all shouldn't necessarily be teachers in the 21st century. They don't have a basis for that. Now, I'm not saying that people shouldn't teach their neighbor, but I think a teacher was a particular job and role in the first century, my conclusion. And uh, that there's three qualifications for a teacher. And number one was that he had to have, he had to be a faithful child of God, right? So, and number two is he had to be sound. And number three, he had to be apt to teach. Okay. I think those are three qualifications for teachers. Any comments? And I think the church had people who were assigned as teachers. And the elders can, can choose men to be teachers. I don't find any women teachers in the, this explicitly, but I think by implication, we had women teaching women in, uh, in First uh, Timothy 5 and also in uh, Titus chapter 2. So I would argue then that uh, the women, we had women teachers of women. Does that make sense now? 
any of my comments. And that again, they had to be faithful, had to, had to be sound, and had to be apt to teach. And uh, and they would be assigned to those roles. And so elders, it's their job to make sure that the women and men, women are teaching women and children, and men are teaching men, and women and children, they can teach anybody. And that uh, they have to be faithful, faithful, sound, and apt to, uh, have the ability to teach. And I think the church should be busy training people to be teachers and to take these roles. And that's what we're trying to do at Barnes. And I wish all congregations would just get busy and get busy training people. Okay. Now then, I'm just preaching to you now. Okay. All right. So you got any questions or comments? When you say sound, that doesn't sound like somebody that's a new convert. No, I don't think a new convert had any business teaching. Okay. All right. I think you can get that from Hebrews 5. All right. There's a time period which you should have grown, should be able to be teachers. Okay. And again, I, I would say not a, a new convert shouldn't be put into a classroom teaching. Be grounded. The church has a good program. They can ground them in a year or two, pretty to where they're busy, able to do some teaching. Okay, and actually, they could put them in as a helper with an experienced teacher. And an experienced teacher, if they're really good at it, they'll they'll show them how to how to teach. You could be taught how to teach, I believe. Okay. Any questions or comments there? Any other questions there, James? No, sir. Okay. Now, all do not work miracles, do they? Do not Not all have gifts uh, of healing to, to have. This is echoes and to ha have gifts of healing. Not all speak in tongues. Not all. And this, uh, let's see what this is uh, discerning, I believe. Not all interpret. And it's like Herman Ewell. Right. The Armenuo. And this is to interpret. Herman, this part of the word here is like we get our word hermeneutics from it. Okay. Hermenuo. And we got an OC ending. Okay. Any questions or comments there? All right. Now I'm going to go over to Ephesians 4.11 and show you something here. And we'll see something else about this. Ephesians 4.11. All right, so go to Ephesians 4.11. All right, now let's look at the English first so we won't have to do too much translating. And he gave some to be apostles, notice to be as in italics, and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. I want you to notice the English punctuation. Now the American Standard and King James are different here. American standard, I believe, is correct. We have a semicolon here, and we have a comma, another semicolon, and a comma, and another semicolon, and a comma, and then watch here. There's no comma right here. Do you see that? I think your King James has a comma there. Let's let's see if it does. I think it does. No, it doesn't. My King James version doesn't have a comma there either. Okay. So it's got the same punctuation. All right. Now, what, what is that about? Why isn't there a comma there? Well, in English, if you get an English uh, grammar rules, the fact that there's no comma here means that the pastors and teachers are the same people. They're the same group with no, no comma there. Now, let me illustrate this. I'll give you an illustration. If I made a will out for my children, and I'll, I'll, I'll just write on this screen up here and then get rid of it. All right. Uh, my three children. Brian, Marcy. Shall share equally. In my estate. 
Now, if that's in my will, how much will Brent get of my estate? Half. That's correct. Because there's not a comma after this. Marcy and Melanie will get half and they'll share it. They'll get a quarter each. Now, if I punctuate it this way, Brent gets how much? A third. That's correct. Does that make sense? Everyone see that? Yep. And that's what the courts would rule because that's what the grammar says. All right. So what I'm saying here now is you gotta you gotta be careful about that punctuation and look at it very carefully. This says the pastors and teachers are the same people. In other words, a pastor is also a teacher. Now, what's one of the qualifications of elders? There to be what? Have to teach. That's correct. So they are to be teachers. All right. Any questions anyone has? All right. I'll kind of watch the clock here. We've gone about 30 minutes. All right. So now then let me go back. For no questions about that, I'm going to go to something else, another, another point. All right. Um, let's go to O just a moment on page 220 in our file. Page 220 on our file. Go to and here's a couple of things I want you to see on O. Okay, right here. O, right here. O. We, it's a summary negation. We've already been through that, but I want you to see something else. If you have O day, it still functions like the what like O does. Okay, it just what it does, it strengthens it. It continues a negation is what it does. And so if we have O and then we have O day, it's continuing that first negation. May day does the same thing as well. Okay. Now here's an interesting thing. And O, o key is a little stronger than O. But it functions pretty much the same way. It's just a little bit stronger. Okay. All right. If you have O with a question and expected answer is yes. Now, Here's something you don't see very often, and this will mess you up <coughs> because we're going to get pretty quickly, and I think two lessons away now from a, a, a particular kind of pronoun. And uh, so we get into these pronouns uh, that we will run into here, and these pronouns like which and what, right? And the pronouns look a lot like this. That's what they look like. I'm going to go over and show you what I'm talking about. All right, let me see. Okay, let me see if I can find it here. There's the other way. I'm sorry, I, I didn't. Here they are. We'll be covering these pretty quickly. These are called relative pronouns, okay? And of course we have them in English, but they look a lot like the article if you look at them. See, that almost looks like an article, but it's got, it doesn't have just a rough breathing. And notice it has a rough breathing and an accent mark too. So you can look at that if you're just hasty, you'll read that as an article if you're not careful. And it's not, it's a, it's a relative pronoun, it's neuter pronoun. And uh, so here's the, here's the thing. Let's go back and I want you to look at what I was looking at now. Over here, we have O with smooth breathing and an accent mark. Everyone see that? Going to come over here to these relative pronouns now. And we have an O with a rough breathing and, and, an, and a circumflex look a lot alike, don't they? They're, of course, they're different. Got a rough breathing, a smooth breathing, and a circumflex, and an acute. 
but you you got to be careful. You'll read this, you'll read this over here as not if you're not careful, or you may read this one here as a, a relative pronoun. So, but here, if we have normally u by itself with no accent mark, it just means not. But if it has an accent mark on it, it's emphatic. And so Persbacher says it means no, and he bold faces it. So it means no. Say no. Any questions? You see that once in a while, and you'll see it. And if it ever hits you, maybe you'll remember what it means. Any questions? Uh, I do have a question on the, uh, the summary negative. Uh, previously, it was mentioned that the U goes before the words it's negating. But in a summary negation, it's, uh, it's negating a series of words, if so to speak. Yes. Or, or is it typically positioned at the beginning of the sentence, or is there a specific pattern? I think it might be at the end with a summary where they got a whole bunch of them. Uh, uh, it could easily negate the first one, though. Okay. Um, I'd have to look at some. I'm sorry. Summary negation. Okay. I remember it mostly always being before the word it negated. If it was negating, it could negate the first one and then go with it. But it could easily have a list of them and this and this and this and this. But uh, a lot of times it'll have ooh over and over again. Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not giving you a good answer. I'll have to study that. I'm sorry. No, no problem. Hey, you ask me questions. <laughs> I can't <laughs> answer all the time. <laughs> who may is emphatic. And so if you have that, uh, not not is uh, in, uh, in algebra, if you have two negatives, that makes it a positive. But it doesn't, so it doesn't do that way here. Okay. Who may is a stronger, it's like no, it's really emphatically no, okay? And stating prohibition emphatically, okay? Now we have another structure that's just a little bit different. You got to be aware of this. Who may is found quite a lot, okay? There is may ooh. May ooh. May ooh is only found. Here's where it's found. All those times about one, two, three, four, five, six, I think seven times in the whole New Testament. But right here, if you run into it, here are the passages where you see it, John 18, 11, Romans 10, 18, 19, 1 Corinthians 9, 4, 5, and 11, 22. So it's it's in all of all of its except one are in John's and Paul's writings, one passage in John's writings. But right here, it's a little bit different. So you need to look at this. You'd be aware we've got this right over here to talk about. And you can study it on your own a little bit, OK? So uh, be aware of that. That's not the same as who may. So may, and those are your, I think, seven passes. One, two, three, four, five, six, I guess. One, two, three, four, five, six. Six passages, OK? I said seven. Can't count, right? Any questions? So just be aware that there is a distinction there. Okay. All right. I, I did have a comment yes. on who may. Isn't that translated as never or also? The word never? Probably because it's it's really emphatic not. See? There is a different word. Uh, that's translated never also, but this could easily be translated never. I wouldn't have a problem with that. Okay. But it's very strong negative. Okay. Not at all. Not at all. No wise by no means. That's later. Okay. Now I want to I want to do something else now. Who and may negate what kind of what part of speech? What part of speech do they negate? Who negates finite verbs, usually in the indicative mood, right? May negates 
the will, and it negates all the other uh, infinitives, participles, and verbs, and the other tenses, other moods, rather. Okay, so kind uh, of keep that in mind. Now, how would you negate a noun? All right. Would it be a fact? So yes, we would use the off of privative. Okay. Uh, the off of privative. All right. Right here. Uh, let's see. It is the privative. Right here is the privative. Uh, like Latin in or English un. Unstable, un, un, unholy uh, or whatever. And so we, the un means not. See, it negates the noun or the substantive. Okay. So right here, the alpha privative. This is Metzger. Okay. Uh, it's an alpha before vowels. And if it's got a vowel, it's the first letter of a word. It will have a new in it, or it could have another letter, depending on what if, what the vowel is. Could be a to see, but it's frequently it's a new. Like our and in English. We don't say a, a apple, we say an apple. See, we put a new in there, an n. Gives a negative sense to the word to which it's affixed. The English suffix un is equivalent to what we're having here. The alpha primitives come into our English language in such words as atheist, agnostic, and these are all Greek words, amoral, asymmetrical, asymptote, atypical, abacterial, abiogenesis. So, any questions now? Now, this this comes to bear in a passage of scripture I want us to look at. So, go to John three thirty four, if you will. We'll go to John three thirty four. I'll have to kind of watch my clock here. John three thirty four. All right. For he whom God has sent speaketh the words of God, for he giveth not the spirit by measure. All right. Now, what's that saying? Now, the King James reads a little differently. So let's look at it. It has unto him in italics. Now, what does that mean? What does it mean when it's in italics? That's an assumption. Not in the text. See, it's an assumption. Okay, keep that in mind. Now, if this is this a is this denying the verb? Is this denying the word give? Or is denying the word measure? Okay. What is what is denied here? And let's look at the Greek now. Let's look at our Greek text. All right. For he whom that's that's a, a relative pronoun he whom god has sent all right the word of god speaks that's Ramata. the word of god he speaks not for not out of met metron not out of a what metron a metro metron is a measure not out of measure, he gives the dose. That's did me. And so he does not give. It's the O denies the verb. It's saying he does not give. The, the, uh, God does not, God's a subject. God does not give the spirit, the spirit that's accused of case. He does not give the spirit by measure. Now, that is read by a, bu a bunch of people. Here's how it's read by them. They read it like it's written this way. They read like there's an alpha right here, right in front of the metro. They, and it's even translated that way in a couple of translations. He gives the spirit unmeasured to, to him. Okay. Well, that's not what the Greek's saying there. It's denying that he gives the spirit by measure. And to him is not even in the text. Okay. See what, what I'm saying here, what I'm driving at? Somebody has actually, they're, they're claiming that the word measure is what's denied. 
And that's that's not what's denied. Okay. If it was denying the word measure, you'd have an offer prohibited on the metron, metro. But he's actually denying the verb. Who denies the verb? So this verb is being denied. The word give is denied. It says he does not give the spirit by measure. God does not give the spirit by measure. But we built a whole system of doctrine on this, claiming that he does give the spirit by measure. Okay, okay, brother, brethren have. Any questions? I find it amazing. Okay. All right. I don't remember. Go ahead. I'm sorry. No, quite all right. I was going to say you're referring to, for example, the apostolic measure. <laughs> yeah. As one of those measures that he doles out. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I, you hear that quite often, or at least I do. Yeah. I've heard. Okay. Let's go to one more passage and then we'll close. And uh, go to the next lesson for for uh, January the, I think the 18th is what I set it up for. Let me check. Yes, January 18th, we'll start back up again. Okay. All right. Let's go to Acts 2 and we'll cover that right quick. Something in Acts 2, 17 and 18. Right. It shall be in the last days, saith God, I will pour forth of my spirit upon all flesh. Now, the, the English translation can be interpreted correctly. Pour forth of my spirit. Now, is this saying the spirit is poured forth, or is, is it saying something is poured forth from the spirit? What's it saying? Well, the English could be either, couldn't it? I believe the English could be either the way it's worded here. But what does the Greek say is what we want to look at. So right here, all right, and it shall be in the last days, says, uh, God says, God says, says God, I will pour out from Apo the spirit of me, the spirit of me. Wait a second. Apo is, takes what case? Help me out here. I forgot. Ablative. Ablative. And that will be source or origin. What was poured out came from the spirit. It's not saying the spirit was poured out. It's saying something was poured forth from the spirit. And if you'll look in uh, in your translations, like an interlinear, uh, they frequently won't even translate up. Oh, <laughs> they leave it out because there's a bias. Most religious groups have a direct operation of the spirit somewhere. And they don't even translate this word. Now, King James and American Standard don't translate it inaccurately, but they're not clear. In other words, it can be interpreted correctly from the English. So they're technically not wrong. They just didn't translate it as clearly as they should have. Ekeo also has a preposition ek on it, which always takes the ablative as well. And so this this verb would make would be ablative. And of course, now remember that it was ablative before the prepositions were chosen, wasn't it? So the, this being ablative to pneumatos uh, was ablative before the prepositions were chosen. So the prepositions were chosen because it was ablative. And so this right here also goes with ablative. Ek does too. Ek and apo only take the ablative case. They don't take any other cases. Both of them do. So we got two reasons to make this rascal ablative case. This right here is a dead ringer. I mean, it just right there just lays it out and hits you right in the face. All right, so right there, what was poured out was not the spirit, but something came from the spirit. We have the, exactly the same words down here in verse 18. And we have Apo in it again. Now then, what I'm saying is, even when miracles were worked, it wasn't the spirit being poured out, it was something coming from the spirit. Any questions? I think the uh, Septuagint even has the word Apo in Joel. I think, I'm pretty sure it does. Okay. Anybody else got any comments? All right, we're gonna we're gonna go out of out right now and end this class, and we'll we'll start the next class in just a few minutes.